Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel podcast, where buyers and AI are like a buddy cop movie. AI crunches the numbers while buyers make the decisions, and together they solve the case of the perfect SaaS. Yours. Yeah, buddy cop movies. Is that Riggs and Murtaugh or like Sergeant Nicholas Angel and Constable Danny Butterman? I know, drop your favorite duo in the comments. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I help B2B SaaS founders like you grow from traction to scale. Here, growth is more than just numbers. It's about crafting a future-proof company, premium valuation, and leaders who build a business of significance while living epic, adventurous lives. Ever wonder why buyers hesitate? Go through the process, get to the end, and then no decision. Well, we crack the case. And here's what they need to know before they commit to your SaaS. Today, we're going to dive deep into three critical elements that your ICP needs to feel confident in choosing your awesome solution. Understanding these three can help you close more deals and turn prospects into happy clients and those happy clients into raving fans sending lots of referrals your way. The SaaS sales landscape can feel like a never ending roller coaster, especially working bigger deals in mid market or enterprise. And as a leader, you know that even the most promising prospects can hesitate at the final steps. Half of the deals are lost to no decision. What? Are you kidding me? No, but it happens. The common challenges include you know, addressing things like scalability, integration concerns, and justifying cost. But more importantly, today's buyers are more informed and empowered than ever. They need just a few small things before making a commitment. But those little things can hold up big, big revenue. So let's unpack the hierarchy of buyer needs so you can win more deals. Sound good? The first one is something I call the success assurance matrix. Buyers need to believe that your SaaS solution will deliver on its promises. Standish Group's Chaos Report 2020 found that approximately 66% of tech projects end in partial or total failure. Gartner reports ERP implementation failure rates can exceed 75%. McKinsey estimates more than 70% of digital transformation efforts, which often include enterprise software purchases, fall short of meeting their targets. No wonder buyers are just a little bit apprehensive about committing. Hey, there's a 60 to 70% chance this decision will crash and burn, but you're telling me it's going to be okay, right? The success assurance matrix solves three big problems. The first is it builds trust. And like I said, that is the foundation of the relationship. The second is that it reduces perceived risk. And is it risk real? It doesn't matter if it's real. If it's in their mind, if it's perceived, then it's real. And we have to overcome that. We have to, to eliminate that perceived risk and make this a low risk decision. And the third is it smooths the decision road gives them what they need to make an informed decision that they feel really, really good about. And this is as much about you know making a head decision as a heart decision. They have to feel like this is the right decision, a good decision. It, it, you know, it feels right in their gut. And it's a little bit fuzzy, but it absolutely has to be that way. And they have to feel that in order to make that decision. Second big thing is what I call the pain gain equation. You know, changing or implementing a new SaaS solution can be a huge undertaking. You know, this is not something they do, they do every day. It's it's scary. It's like, you know, hey, we just met, but uh, you know, put your business in my hands. Trust me, 60-70% chance of failure, it's all going to be good. But they need assurance that the benefits will outweigh the challenges and pain of transition. So to overcome this, we need to be able to demonstrate a seamless implementation process robust support and a clear roadmap for integration. We've got to be able to lay it out and say, here are the steps. We need to take them through like we've done this before because you know, hopefully we have, they haven't. And I think that's that's one of those things that's a difference is that perception of, you know, they, they have not been through this. And we look at it and we go, oh, it's no big deal. To them, it's a huge deal. They don't do this every day. We got to help them understand that the short-term effort 
will lead to long-term gains. You know, making the switch not just be bearable, but beneficial. That's kind of like going to the, the gym. Nobody wants to do that, but they want the outcome. And so we're willing to go through the pain in order to have that outcome. And that's what we want to show them is that the pain is well worth the outcome. Little pain, a lot of outcome. Third big one is what I would call the influence amplifier. You know, advocating for a new SaaS solution isn't just about the product. It's not about solving a problem for the business. It's very much about the person who is championing that solution. Now, buyers want to know that their decision will enhance their reputation within the organization, not damage it. So provide them with the tools they need and the information they need to present a compelling case to stakeholders. You know, when their internal status is elevated by choosing your solution and they perceive that that's what's going to happen, they're more likely to push and support the adoption of your solution. You need that champion inside. It's hard to develop, but well worth it. You know, they don't want to bet their career on you. And so we want to make it a really easy thing. And, and they have that perception of, okay, if I go with this, this is a good choice and it's going to elevate my status. Uh, this is also why there are so many committees that make decisions now. And maybe that's why 70% of projects fail also. But it, it's really not just, uh, you know, getting the, the buy-in of one person. Now we have to do that with the, a lot of times with committees and those kinds of things because nobody wants to stick their neck out by themselves. And what you want to do is develop champions that, that have that passion and go, yes, this is the solution and advocate for you inside, even within the committee. So the combination of these three creates that aha moment where everything clicks and they move from uncertainty or no action to yes, this is the right solution. And that alignment not only secures buy-in, but also drives the organization forward with confidence. Now, understanding what buyers really want for their organizations and for themselves is absolutely essential. And by focusing on the SaaS buyer's hierarchy of needs, you win more deals and turn more prospects into raving fans. Our expert last week was Jordan Burton, co-founder of Talgo. We talked about building amazing cohesive teams, and it all starts with good sourcing, flawless interviewing, and finding the right match for your company, which may be way different than somebody else's company. So how can you hire with confidence? Our founder last Tuesday was Albert Awusu Asari, co-founder and CEO of Kadana a global payments provider, we talked about the challenges of building an international business, hiring and paying remote employees, and the twists and turns of the founder journey, particularly crossing borders. If you missed either one of those episodes, go back and give them a listen. So much good stuff there. My guest today is Amarpreet Kalkat, founder of Humantic AI, an innovative startup hailed by the Wall Street Journal as potentially world-changing. We've got such great stuff going on there. As one of India's pioneering AI entrepreneurs, Amarpreet has been creating AI products since 2014, 10 years, including Froley AI, recognized as a leader in AI-enabled consumer intelligence. Welcome someone who is passionate about building intelligent software that fosters deep, meaningful connections. Our guest today, Amarpreet Kolkat. Hey, Amarpreet, welcome to SaaS Fuel. Well, thank you for having me here, Jeff. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm looking forward. I am as well. You've been building AI products for a long time, 10 years, probably longer than most people thought AI was around. <laughs> yeah. how, how did you start in that journey? And, and what does that look like leading up to the launch of Humantic? So I'll, I'll surprise you and um, maybe the audience here with, with, with something even more unbelievable. Yeah, that's a, 10 years is already unbelievable. Uh, my fascination yes. with AI goes back 25 years. 26, wow. actually. 26. Fascination. I am not saying I was, I've was. i been a builder for these 26 years, but um, most people don't know there was a huge AI wave towards the end of 90s. It, it was a thing. People thought AI had arrived. It, it was probably the third wave already. And this is, I don't know, fourth or fifth wave now. But finally, it's gone mainstream. Yeah. So that's that's the big difference. So, so my active journey goes back 10 years, as you mentioned. This is my second AI startup, second SaaS startup. Uh, been building AI uh, for a while, and I think it's just uh, fascinating, uh, thrilling, exciting to see uh, what's happening in the market today. There's just so much going on. That's great, and that's absolutely right. It, it, so much has changed, even in the last couple of years, and and I like that. Just the thought of, of mainstream because it's right. been there for quite a while. 
Indeed. But uh, the last year and a half, two years, you know, mainstream is definitely the right word. Yes, it is. It is. So tell me about Humantic and what inspired you to, to start that and, and buyer intelligence. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, so Humantic, yeah, I think uh, in, in many ways in our lives, right, uh, one thing leads to another. So you, you do something that leads to something. Uh, that, that's, that's how our journeys are. And at some point, we develop the clarity. So for me, like I said, my fascination with AI goes back a long time. So a long time ago, and there's just a bit of background here, uh, I started thinking about intelligent software. I just used to just call it intelligent software. I'm talking 2000s, late 2000s. I think software needs to be more intelligent. Um, 2010, um, I was 10 years in the industry since I graduated. I said, hey, we're still not building intelligent software the way I think it should be. And that's what led me to start on my startup journey in actually 2011. So I started my first startup, did a couple of smaller experiments, and then properly started in 2013, late 2013, early 2014. And uh, uh, that was called Frol AI. That was my first AI startup um, uh, that I did, it was in the consumer intelligence space, similar to working with some forms of social data. Okay. So one of one of the things we learned there, uh, Jeff, was how well we could understand people because there's just so much data, right? All of us are leaving such a large data trail in many ways. Uh, now, some parts of that trail are not really worth, uh, they should not be looked into, right? Privacy, uh, for example, what you say on Facebook is largely intended for your friends, let us say, or family. I don't think it's a great idea to be looking into that. But there's also a lot that we leave publicly. Um, what I say in this podcast, for example, it'll be, in fact, it, it'll be unwise if someone who wants to talk to me doesn't try to learn right and say, Amarpreet, I watch your podcast with Jeff. This is what appeals to you. And I'll be, it'll be such a better conversation because they, they've understood me a little bit better. So that's... Right. That's what we zeroed in into saying, what if we could understand people uh, because the data is there while being totally respectful, choose what data to look at and what not. So we chose not to look at any private or quasi-private data at all. So we, like Humantic AI only looks at your LinkedIn profile right now. We're extending it to analyze, for example, what happens in a Zoom call or a call like this one. And again, that's data you have access to. So very, very cognizant of that. but that understanding about people, and we said, bigger picture, if people knew each other better before they spent time with each other, before they've interacted, how much richer, how much productive, how much more you know, uh, heartwarming, in some ways, those conversations could be, right? A little bit like going back to that town square, uh, where everyone knows everyone, sort of, at some level, rather than the big city where everyone is a stranger. You don't know if your neighbor's daughter's or son's name, right? Because you never talk. It's just right. a nod in the in the corridors. So that was, you know, that was the thought. Um, sales became a natural, uh, you know, starting point because it's such a transactional activity. Hey, Jeff, uh, give me some money. I'll give you my product, right? So transactional. Right. Um, yeah, that's, so we said, but we know as sellers and you, I, we both been sellers that, the core of sales, and especially large value sales, is trust. It's it's yes. the ability to trust someone and say, I think Jeff is someone I can purchase from. And today, we have enough options. It's not a scarce world anymore, right? There's enough options. There's even the best products, uh, there's five products that are equally good. And that that was our thought process, what we ended up calling buyer intelligence. This is insights and intelligence about your buyers. A uh, significant part is deeply behavioral, tells you what matters to the other person so that when you go into that sale, you're not tooting your own horn, right? You're not like me, this, my product, this, right? You're saying, look, this is what matters to Jeff. Maybe Jeff's biggest concern at the back of his head is the risk of adopting a technology like Humantic AI. And if I come in and say, yeah. Jeff, we're the best thing since sliced bread, you'll be like, what are you saying, right? Uh, because you're not thinking, is it the best thing? You're thinking if you could be making a mistake for your company. So I, right. should be coming, I should be coming and saying, Jeff, look, I understand that this is a big change. I am here to be your partner and help your organization move forward while making sure we address the risk. And you'll say, 
I love this guy. These are the people I want to work with. So that's yeah. buyer intelligence. It's it's a peek into the buyer's behavior and a lot more than that. It's an ability to personalize and customize. It's an ability to fundamentally put your buyer first and say, I matter, my product matters, but my buyer matters more. What they care about matters more and I will sell that way. Uh, we, we call it buyer for selling, right? So I, I, will, I will be a buyer for seller. And the results of that, we'll talk about that in a minute, are just absolutely incredible. It seems like it would make a, a much better sales interaction, uh, really focusing on on the buyer and what they care about. Uh, how accurate is the the data? I mean, how do you know what they care about or what things are, are important to them You know, walking into a sales conversation? So two ways we know it. Two ways we know it, I would say. One is purely scientifically speaking. So our users, we tell them to expect around 85% accuracy, 80 to 85 so we're not always right. Okay. It's AI. It can be wrong. We all know the mistakes it makes. Sure. Now, so we are not LLM based. We're not chat GPT based. The core behavior prediction AI is our own top right free model. We've built it ground up. So that's the, uh, if you're familiar with something called disk personality profiling, uh, I don't know if you, that's kind of a framework that yes. we use. The disk, yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, we combine it with that chat GPT, LLMs, Gen AI to start writing emails, you know, the way your buyer prefers and so on. So one, we know it scientifically. We've had psycho, um, IO, you know, psychologists uh, who study organizational psychology do a study. We've done that around three years ago where they measured humantic accuracy against uh, observed behavior and they reached that conclusion. They correlated it with some other forms of studies like traditional assessments, for example. Second. Most of the customers, and we work with some fairly large companies at this point, before they start out, this is, as you can expect, a question that always comes up, hey, accuracy. So people have studied that. Right. We, have, we have a few thousand users and a few hundred companies using us now. But the third part, which I think um, is most important, uh, it's a bit of indirect validation, but I, I'll, I'll see if we can share with you but every customer that's taken a measurement of our impact, and we do some measurement ourselves, the impact that we've been able to have, our average impact on closed one revenue is 16%, 16.2%. Wow. So same, same pipe is converting 16% better. The best result I have seen on that one actually was recent. A customer who'd been using us for one year compared deals where Humantic was used versus not across 1,200 opportunities. Deals where Humantic was used by their reps had converted 37% better, 37%. So now that would only happen, that would not happen randomly. Like I said, it's an indirect validation. And we've seen this across a dozen studies. Email side, our average impact is 109% on response rates. We've seen 200, 300%. We've seen 46%, 40%. So that is another way of telling us that the reason it's happening, right, is that uh, uh, since you're a ship in the sea, you've lost your compass, and you know that you're supposed to reach this uh, land where there's a lot of uh, sequoia trees, you know. Let's just say for a second. Now you reach that land, and if you do see sequoia trees, odds are you sailed in the right direction. Right? So that's what I'm saying, that results wouldn't come you know, unless the accuracy is there. And we've seen right. results that have made us, currently we are number two most adopted sales AI in, in North America mid-market, uh, number three across enterprise North America, number seven in the world, uh, you know, globally speaking. On, on G2, this data is from G2, yeah. That is impressive. Well, as we think about you know, AI and sales, one of the concerns, I guess, is you know, just that the lack of human connection. But how does Humantic help sales pros humanize those interactions with buyers? And, and you know, why does it matter? So th that's, that's the million-dollar question, I would say. And that, that is indeed the big question. Uh, you know, If I think uh, the listeners, if you're making a connect the name Humantic AI, Right, that's where it comes from. It's it's the desire, uh, it's our stated aim of helping you humanize uh, 
uh, interactions in, from our perspective, humanize how AI gets leveraged today. So going back to what I said, when we say humanize, when we say connection, right, human connection, what is really happening that builds that connection? So what the psychologists would tell you, and we understand at some level, is you find some commonality that binds you, shared values, for example, wow. shared beliefs, or at least commonality. You, you love the same team, gives you small reason to connect, right? Uh, you've lived in the yeah. same city, you went to the same college, always gives you a reason. Those things bring us together. And in sales world, we know we, it's a popular saying, right, that uh, people like people who are similar to them. People trust people that they like and people buy from people that they trust, right? So similarity leads to liking, liking leads to trust and trust needs to sale, leads to sales. So, yeah. so that's what we bring into the table. For example, uh, when I saw your profile right before this call, it tells me, uh, it, you know, it sort of tells me that if I, let us say, um, it would essentially, for example, advise me to uh, not hold off from cracking a joke with you or being a little informal. Or Now, that's not true for everyone. We might say so. There are sure. people. Yes, I, I've sold to people. I, I stereotypically, let us say you're this somewhat nerdy. I, that could be me, you know, founder of a startup. Uh, from a tech background, you went to Stanford Computer Science. Maybe that's not the best person. Maybe they are very reserved. You know, they... They don't like that over familiar, you know, familiarity. Whereas stereotypically, again, I'm just making my point. You could be a seller who's just always friendly. So, right. But not every seller is friendly, and not every CTO or a founder is is a nerdy, uh, you know, uh, aloof, introverted person. So when we understand each other, uh, and we change our behavior a little bit, like uh, you know, science shows we in sales we've learned about techniques like mirroring. What is mirroring? Right. When you nod, I nod. I use that. Exactly. Tool. Yes. So that's all. So we are, similarity leads to likeness, likeness leads to trust and that to sales. And that is the process of what we call humanization, where we don't sound robotic. You're using, chat, everyone's trying chat GPT and AI to write emails. We all can literally recognize chat, chat GPT written emails today, right? It's just so 100%. structured, so proper. Add the humantic. We call that the humantic flavor, Gen AI. Add humantic. For you, it might actually make it very informal, very slightly casual, slightly friendly, slightly. For someone else, it actually might completely go that way. For So it knows, and I'm just saying one or two things, but it knows a lot more about you and what matters to you. And when you get that email, odds of you saying, this is too mechanical and robotic, they go down significantly. So that, that's how we think about Humanization, right. that's the impact of humanization on selling. And that any large deal seller specifically, they, they know how much vital the trust and relationship uh, part really becomes uh, in closing deals. I think it's really interesting just to think about, you know, what it is that, that people would respond to and how they want to be communicated with. Because you're exactly right. And I, I get chat GPT emails all the time. And, uh, and I can always tell if it's automated yeah. and especially, you know, things like, you know, Hey, I see you went to college at this place. I'm like, well, that was, you know, 20 plus years ago. It's irrelevant today yeah. and be, you know, kind of fake personalization. And I think right. that lowers status, that lowers the, the trust factor where really communicating with somebody in a way that that's relational and, and, you know, really builds that no like, and trust factor. So that's, that, that's, uh, I mean, the, you know, points like these, they almost get me animated because uh, it should be very apparent to everyone. It should be, and it probably is. People are smart, leaders are smart, but often enough, we don't want to bite the bullet, right? We don't want to make the hard choices. If everyone's making easy choices, it gives us an excuse to make easy choices. So hmm. um, I, I see a lot of people, you know, experimenting with AI SDRs, for example, right now, beginning to happen, I would say, early days, uh, or personalization, like, again, we talk about something, we call it authentic personalization. That's kind of our terminology, nothing nothing more. But the point there is we're stressing the need to bring authenticity. Personalization is important. 
it's very helpful. Uh, my belief, and sometimes there's a debate between people saying relevance matters, personalization doesn't. Both matter. Relevance yes, they is, do. Yes, relevance is saying, does Jeff need Humantic AI? Does, Jeff, does Jeff's company need Humantic AI? It's, you know, is relevant. And there's a lot of ways to find that. But now everyone has access to Zoom Info and Bambora and Six Sense and Apollo and whatnot. 20 people will find out that Jeff went and searched for uh, buyer intelligence or sales intelligence, right? And 20 people will reach out. How do you become those three? No company will engage more than three vendors, you know, for any particular use case. How do you become one of those three? Mm. That to me is personalization. So, so that's what we say, the need of the company and the want of the buyer. You combine those, that's the best possible combination that you could be that you could be working with. But that authenticity is critical. Uh, we all lose that. Uh, we just say, oh, personalization, tick mark, personalization done. But have you taken the best shot? It's okay to use AI. I don't think that's a big problem. Some people say sure. it should be done done manually. That's, to me, that's like saying, uh, you know, letters should be written by hand and not through a typewriter or a computer, right? So that's, that's not the important thing. Uh, but the point is, are you genuinely paying attention to your buyer? Are you trying to keep it real? Or are you not bothered about your buyer? You don't care if they get 1,000 emails. You don't care if they get spammed you know, to death. That's, that's a bad thing, right? So that's, then, then you're not being a buyer, uh, buyer first or even buyer cognizant, uh, you know, buyer aware seller. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you have a, a partnership with Sandler in uh, the, the sales world. Uh, how has that gone and, you know, what is the the connection points between sales and kind of the, the Sandler methodology and the, then the reception in the industry to the the combination? Yeah, so Sandler partnership, I think, is one of uh, one of uh, our, you know, best partnerships. It's, it's one of the partnerships I'm most proud of. Uh, fundamentally, the most important thing is that, you know, there's something that binds us together and that is the Sandler method and our belief. So that is the most important thing. The Sandler method stresses, uh, you know, it puts a huge importance on the people, on the relationship and on trust. So right. it puts, uh, which is something we believe in deeply, right? And that's, that's uh, all across our product. You will see it across our marketing. Everywhere you'll see that, uh, you know, coming through. So we, we try to do that. The second part there is, again, the, the Sandler method talks about uh, selling not as a transactional activity, but something more than that, something as problem solving, something where you are helping uh, you know, your customers find, find a solution. You are not just a vendor trying to get a sale, right? For example, uh, you know, the Sandler method uh, talks significantly about um, uh, treating yourself as an equal. Right to to your buyer rather than uh, saying you the buyer you're everything and I am no one no that's not about it. It talks about uh, you know taking people to the right place. If that right place means um, that you are not a part of that solution, then so be it. Right. So there's a lot of focus on that authenticity and uh, 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 you know keeping people first, which is something we believe in. So that really ties and binds us. Uh, we both, uh, you know, disk is very important part of the Sandler uh, method, Sandler way of uh, training. Uh, disk is very important part of our product. And, uh, you know, right now at this point of time, our partnership is very, very comprehensive. We work uh, with 100 plus, you know, more than 50%, I think, of Sandler franchises. And uh, we work with their enterprise teams. Uh, there are, um, you know, our customers where Sandler uh, is coming in. Uh, you know, with training, uh, et cetera, uh, because they know some of the things about sales, uh, disk, um, uh, personalization, et cetera, better, I would say, than we do as, as uh, sales experts. Uh, we come in as one of the leading AI technologies that reinforces, you know, what some of the beliefs that they hold and uh, what their customers are also uh, looking for. So I think, yeah, so that's one of the partnerships that we've enjoyed uh, tremendously. Yeah, fantastic. You know, bunch of uh, bunch of people. Uh, the sh again, the sh what we share, I think that binds us because they believe in something that we also believe in. 
and uh, just gives us so many more chances to uh, do business together. Ready to future-proof your company and scale to new heights? Dive into the ultimate resource designed for SaaS founders and C-suite executives. Champion Leadership Group gives you an unfair advantage in scaling up revenue and outwitting competitors. Imagine solving your biggest scaling headaches, hitting 5, 10, 20 million ARR and beyond without the headaches or heartburn. We take away the guesswork and the grunt work and replace it with framework by supporting you with our on-demand fractional C-suite team, a powerful operating system built into software, and a thriving community of fellow scaling founders. Your results are our measure of success. Stuck at your current revenue level? This is your ticket out. Feel like your company is the world's best kept secret? We amplify your success. And hey, if you're already crushing it but too busy to breathe, we got you. We'll free up 20% of your time in the first month. Now is a time to upgrade from traction to scale. If you're ready to work smarter, not just grind harder, schedule a 10 minute growth brainstorm. It's free. We'll pinpoint the number one thing blocking revenue. Visit championleadership.com where leaders evolve and companies transform. What have been some of the challenges in building Humantic? I mean, no, no journey is always up and to the right. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not at all. No, this is in <laughs> fact, see, I, uh, sometimes people would say, hey, how much do you want to talk about it? Again, if you're talking about being authentic, I think uh, we have to walk that talk, right? So we, uh, I'm never, I never shy away from uh, talking about the bad along with the good. Uh, on, some, on one side, we've been lucky, right? I would say we've been lucky than uh, most companies in our stage. So as I mentioned to you, we are, we're the second most popular sales AI. A lot of companies that start considering AI, they, they say, okay, let's consider Humantic AI. That's a great place to be in. But on the other side, nothing, nothing is easy. If anything, it's, it's really a choice between impossible, extremely hard, and very, very hard, right? There's, there's nothing less than that. It's not even hard, right? Everything is either very, very hard or extremely hard or pretty much impossible, <laughs> right? So those are the choices right. you're working with as a startup. So for us, uh, one, what we do, for a lot of people, it's very new, right? So yeah, many people don't even know that AI can predict this. It's like really, so it's one moment magical and one moment too good to be true. So that's, we have to take them past that bridge and say, look, it is actually possible technology is there. Not an easy thing, right? When... Um, you're seeing technology do something that doesn't seem true, and that's also slightly hard to hard to validate. So that's one challenge that we face. Uh, good problem, but it's like, oh, this is too good to be true. This is almost magical. We you know we we hear both the reactions. Second part for people is how much does it really move the needle? Yes, this makes right. sense. Yes, this makes sense. Ability to know someone, trust, etc. So we've spent quite a bit of time in putting the instrumentation in place, measurement in place, like the exam numbers I shared with you, so that we can tell our customers that it's not just wishy-washy uh, relationships and trust and all that fancy, jazzy stuff. It actually moves the needle. Uh, research shows that, like Gartner has a stat where it says that when you can make your buyers feel comfortable, those deals close 30% more, three zero. There's wow. 30% more. There's a study in a book called The Sales Innovation Paradox where they studied, I think, I forgot how many companies, 30 or 300. But when you bring in personality element into personalization, the number of touches required to create an opportunity, would you believe, comes down from 21 to 6.7. It's a study. Wow. So look at Exhibit B of Sales Innovation Paradox. It's a beautiful book. And, uh, you know, studies show that. We all know uh, that um, trust creates deals, but these numbers combined with what we have seen, what our customers are able to see, we've built quite a bit of instrumentation into uh, our Salesforce integration and sales loft and outreach. And you will be able to, within a month, you'll start seeing the numbers um, coming, uh, coming through. Wow. Yeah, that's really, really good. I'll have to check that book out. We'll make sure and put a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's do that. It's by Dr. Howard Dover. 
Um, I've loved that book. I think uh, uh, it's definitely uh, for 2023. It was one of the best books uh, you know that that I read. Jolt Effect is another you know good one. Talks about something similar. So those these are two good books uh, from a sales perspective. You know, for the sellers listening to this who like to read, I would uh, strongly recommend these yeah. two books. That's good. So how do you overcome the the new? So you're you're you know bringing the solution to market. Yeah. Companies are not really sure what that the value is. It's something that's new. They haven't tried it before. Which is, is good because it's a greenfield opportunity, but then <laughs> they've never tried it before. So how do you overcome that and break through those barriers and say, you know, this is something that you you really need? So I think the two two three pieces, you know, to to that strategy. Uh, the easy part is we we start out and we focus more on people who are already aware uh, and believe. So if like we know that someone who under knows disk and believes in disk is highly likely to see value very quickly. So we try to focus more there because that's that's easier ground for us to climb, uh, right? It's uh, yeah, instead of a bike, it's like an electric bike. You know, you you get an extra slight extra boost. It's still a hill, uh, right? There's now mm-hmm. always a hill. Second, we've if you've seen us around, I think we are reasonably, if not you know, uh, popular on LinkedIn, etc. We have a pretty strong word of mouth. Almost two out of five. Or maybe 2.5, uh, you know, uh, two plus of, of five opportunities for us come through referrals and word of mouth. Someone tells someone, uh, so that drives uh, a big part. We we like to do some creative, interesting things. Um, uh, we generally think marketing doesn't have to be boring, so we uh, we try to convey the message. For example, recently there was this conference by the Gartner. CSO conference, sales leader conference in uh, uh, Vegas uh, two weeks, uh, maybe maybe a month ago. I think it was three, four uh, weeks ago. So, uh, you know, we've got a lot of uh, sellers and sales leaders there, and we were trying to uh, remind them of the value of knowing their wa- buyer. So we had these uh, trucks running outside with, uh, uh, you know, s- some simple slogans, but some like catchy. For example, one of the slogans was, uh, right, we uh, it's often said what women want. You know, no one knows what women want. Right, uh, comes up. It was like what <laughs> women want. We don't know, but at least you can find out what your buyers want. Right, and buyer intelligence. So, <laughs> so we, it's a bit That's of great. fun. It's a bit of wit. You know, so just convey the message. Make people think without really boring them to death. Um, leverage partnerships. I think that's been coming up again and again. And uh, we've, uh, you know, we've been lucky. Uh, you know, you mentioned Sandler, fantastic, you know, partnership there. AWS, Amazon, we have a, you know, partnership in place. Uh, we built, a, uh, you know, sort of an advisory network. You know, those uh, people have been have been wonderful. Some of them are actually featured as part of this campaign that we, run, you know, that we ran. So we we really uh, try to um, do more with the uh, with the community, so to of course, speak and just work with others. Keep it a little bit easy, not not to get stuck up and start drinking our own Kool Aid, right? So uh, try to do those few things. Oh, that's good. When well, the the sales process, are you using buyer intelligence? Because I hear this, there's a great product called Humantic that uh, that will help you in that. Do you <laughs> use that as well? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I wish my <laughs> I wish my sellers would use it more, you know. So, uh, but I think uh, pretty much everyone on our team uh, uses it. Uh, significantly, um, what we see, and uh, you know, like we've been building our team up. Our sales team is around uh, six people, five people now. Uh, our GTM team is around uh, you know eleven people. So, so it's a good microcosm for us to see where do people struggle, and what we have seen. Yeah, yeah we've seen with our users too. That the good thing is getting getting to like sixty, seventy percent of humantics value is easy, um, yeah, because the product's very easy. We we are generally available everywhere through a browser extension, through integrations, uh, you know, through uh, through some data APIs, etc. We are available everywhere. People reps go and spend their time, and uh, people get to 60, 70 percent point pretty easy. You know, how to prepare before a meeting? What do you say? What do you not say? The the final, you know, 30, 40 percent that has a bit of a learning curve. So, for example, it's easy enough for a rep to be using who's using Humantic AI to say. Okay, I'm going to this one. I'll take a more informal approach, friendly. Maybe crack another joke or crack one, you know, fewer jokes, etc. But how do you how do you use Humantic AI to even decide 
uh, where you should use, you know, the challenger way of closing versus not. I can tell you, and you're familiar with this, if you use the challenger method with a C-type personality uh, who tends to be slightly slightly more touchy, I would say, more, they tend to believe their knowledge more, they're very, they, they're very information seekers, and generally they know more too, that has much higher odds of uh, backfiring. With a D-type, mm. absolutely a great method, you know, challenger method, but you'll have to do it very respectfully. Uh, it's very, very easy to, they, they're, they're not touchy, you know, but um, uh, they, they they can take, you know, the egos, let us say, could be bigger or, uh, you know, respect becomes very, very important. Uh, with the S-type personality, challenger method is probably not uh, the best method, I would say, uh, you know, uh, for that matter. So, that's a bit of advanced uh, skilling that comes in. Uh, how do you engage an economic buyer? So many reps just fail, right, at engaging senior stakeholders because they can't talk their language. They they just right. they can just talk about their product and the technical stuff, but they can't talk the you know the EB's uh, language. So uh, so some of those things take time. Other things be made very easy, like email personalization, social calling so you you just click one button and it just changes the your template it changes it separately for differently for chef versus Amarpreet versus john versus jane so uh, that's that's uh, you know that's humantic ai and this uh, uh, you know uh, nifty little tool called humantic ai how we try to use that do you or maybe some of your clients try and match personalities between buyers and and the sales reps? Do you do any kind of matching that way where you you know that you have that natural rapport from the very beginning? It's a great, 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 great question. Again, I think a great observation for that matter. You I think you've got onto a, a valuable point. Some, very few, very few. We ourselves don't spend too much time because um like we consider it one of the advanced use cases. So typically we would bring it uh, later on, you know, uh, once uh, the reps, et cetera, have gotten going, that's also a little bit more of a RevOps uh, sort of a use case. But okay, we have a few customers, like one of our customers, the NASDAQ listed, uh, you know, data BI company. Uh, they sat down, they did two things. Uh, so these both are part of the advanced use case. One, they analyze their wins and losses through the personality lens. Of wow, yes, and they realized that there were three personality types that they were winning almost thirty percent more with, and when the reps now prioritize those a little bit higher, that increases their odds, so that's one part, like in our case, our data shows that with roughly the d personality d d s uh, d s i uh, we succeed almost two x two point three x more. And with a wow. S or a C, pure S or a C, we can we succeed less than half of the normal. Now, what does that mean? That and there's a beauty in this advanced use case, uh, and I'll come back to the matching part also in a second. But these two, one inbounds, we still process everyone. We of course uh, personalize our approach based on what you know where you are. And I'm just saying it's DISC. We break down personalities into 36 groups, so there's a lot more nuance. On outbound, you know, Jeff, we don't, we don't even really outbound to non-D personality types because we know who's most likely to purchase from us, why there's enough people, the universe of our customers' prospects is not small. So why should we put time into those that convert only one-fifth of the others, right? A D type is converting 2.5X, a C type is converting, let us say, 0.5x. That's a 5x difference in conversion. That's big. It's it's big. And second part is the matching part. That I think again, very few customers have done it. More advanced, uh, you know, use case. I don't think anyone's measured or at least shared results with us. Uh, we ourselves, we we we've, we've done it. I would say sparingly, you know, here and there. <laughs> so um, we don't have as much infrastructure, RevOps, etc. But when, for example, we have done any kind of bulk allocation, we tend to we tend to do that. Like recently, I was allocating uh, you know certain certain leads, certain partners, and uh, we have one seller who's a high eye, talks a lot, 
uh, energy and whatnot. And we have one seller who's very thoughtful, um, studious, goes deeper, uh, very consultative seller. And um, while doing that, you know, so I kept that in mind because if I put this, the thoughtful consultative seller with, you know, any high energy uh, partner, let us say, uh, they it, it's it's harder for them to connect because they they don't think the same, they don't talk the same language. So so yeah, so that is we don't have a measurement on that yet, but um, uh, there is definitely value in putting compatible people together where uh, you allocate a lead uh, to a person who's more likely to engage them effectively. That's really, really smart. A use case that I hadn't thought about was, you know, do certain personality types, you know, you know buy at a that higher rate? Measured. Are they, they, yeah. That, measured. that, that, that is measured too. so smart to think about that. And who do we target? Because you got this, this giant ocean of buyers and, you know, potential prospects. How do we prioritize them? I think that's brilliant. It's really going after the ones that are, you know, have shown a propensity to, to really get it. And, and look at the solution and go, yes, this is exactly what we need. And those are the ones you want to talk to first. Right, right. Uh, any ethical considerations, you know, come into play when using AI for buyer intelligence and, and how do you address those? I, I would break it down into, into two, two parts, the ethical considerations. Uh, one is um, as, a, as a product, right, as a platform, how ethical are we and what do we bring to the table? Yeah. And second is there's still, in spite of what we might or might not do, and some companies choose to do more and some choose to do less, there is a certain amount of power that you still live with the user uh, to, to use a tool effectively, right? Uh, technology is in many ways, it's, it's power at different levels. Uh, we can use it for yeah. so, many, so many different uses. Uh, I've always spoken about it. Take anything, take nuclear energy, you can make a bomb, you can make electricity. You know, uh, take sure. uh, take electricity. You can use it to electrocute someone. You use can use to light the house. Take fire. I, every technology of some type, there, right? And uh, there, there is. Uh, it comes down to how we use it. So, from our perspective, mm -hmm. like I said, ethically, uh, ethically speaking, our point of view, first of all, is the bare minimum line. Bare minimum, I'm saying, is to respect legality. Right? What well, what is the legal framework? That's the bare minimum. Uh, rather than try to straddle the gray lines, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we, we keep that in mind. We don't think that is, that's all you need to do, right? Beyond that, uh, I would say comes the more moral responsibility, what you believe is, is right, you know, use versus, you know, not right use. Like I said, um, it's easy enough for us to make use of personal data. Legally also it's possible. You just need a few frameworks, a few checks uh, in place, but we choose not to because we think that's not what a person is expecting, right? So when, um, like I said, when I'm posting something on Facebook, while it could be seen by others, it's not you know, really that hard, but I'm probably thinking that I'm posting it for my family and friends and my network, right, of people who, are, who, who will see right. that. Whereas when I'm posting on LinkedIn, I'm actually probably wanting more and more people, or Twitter for that matter, right? I want more people to see it. I'm being very, very public. It's like, shouting from your rooftop and you want as many people as possible to hear that. So what data do we, do we consider? Um, we get access to quite a bit of data uh, when we do the integrations into our customer CRM. Uh, for example, a browser extension. We have a browser extension many companies have. Uh, it only accesses data from, I think, 14 websites. On all others, it's blocked from accessing. The okay. customer, the user doesn't know that. If he said, you give us access, they will give us access to everything everywhere. We could ask for it, but we choose to limit it to those 14 sites. Even on those 14 sites, then we only read, for example, a couple of fields and we have a document that outlines everything. So we've tried to keep it absolutely minimal what is required to serve uh, the, you know, the customer more effectively. Beyond that, we, you know, we don't need to. So that's from a platform perspective. Uh, for us, these are the important considerations. What data we leverage for predicting behavior and what data do we access while a customer uses us? Uh, and we try not to even get access uh, just because we can. And many companies don't play like that. Most, uh, I'm a capitalist in that sense, I'm a founder, but 
uh, my belief is 80% of the companies don't don't you know they should play more morally you know more uh, more fairly they not just legally yeah. okay. we're all still too focused on making money that that should not we shouldn't be as focused on making money we should be less focused on making money uh, again that's a like that's that. a ph- philosophical point of view you know bigger second part is with the users right now how do you how do you leverage um we can nudge we try but are you like when you for example humanity gave you uh, someone's profile someone's you know insights about uh, you know someone are you not thinking oh man i can manipulate this person right versus i can be more real and authentic with this person you could you could use it sort of both ways uh, it, it is possible sure. yeah and if let us say uh, some uh, sometimes i'll give the example saying it's the difference between being a local pd cop versus being an fbi detective right so you're still a detective you you know uh, log attached to your local uh, pd and uh, but the fbi detective is hopefully uh, significantly more uh, trained uh, and has significantly more you know uh, tricks up up their sleeve uh, many of us have sure. you know uh, heard of chris wass book on uh, and what not if i yes. am now i'm a hostage negotiator i think it's just fair to use any means necessary at that point of time including manipulating right your the person that you're negotiating with you know for a for a hostage because that's a good use case but in sales we are not we're not hostage negotiators right this this no one's life at stake so it's up to us whether we decide to use it in a positive manner uh, or we use it uh, to uh, manipulate at some level and uh, that's we try to give the frameworks we try to keep those uh, checks in place the insights we give are all focused on helping you be more effective help you close more while creating a positive experience uh, for the for the other person uh, we try not to give you insights where you can um, like we don't our insights don't include something like uh, this person feels really insecure about their place in the team and uh, use that to tell them you know how it could look cooler right we could say that it's actually psychologically it's possible and sometimes we feel sure. that way but that's that's not what we say we might say this person believes in you know involving more people from their team early so talk to them about you know who are the other people that they should engage right so um, so yeah that's something our users have to Uh, you know keep in mind and essentially work with a stronger moral fabric i would say uh, it's really really good uh, it's very well thought through and uh, the way that you've built the solution the way it's deployed and the right. the use case right. yeah. you know just your, your sales people using it i think is really smart uh, being a browser plugin you you've put it into the workflow of what they're already doing so i think you know getting someone to use a solution especially something that's new especially sales people you know to yeah. use yeah. the solution and get value is is difficult uh, how have you you know in addition to to just putting it in something they're already using how have you helped adoption so uh, i love your questions again uh, i i i have to say that because these are things i stress a lot on often uh, you know we'll be telling our customers saying and this is uh, let me put it out this is actually the most important question that 98% of our prospects don't ask and i'm guessing they're not asking anywhere so if you're a buyer manager leader listening to this i would say please ask the adoption question especially in saas but broadly too there's way too much shelf here tools just lying around yes was talking to someone they said they had 110 zoom in full licenses and uh, they're using only 12 of them you got 110 wow. and now they're waiting for the contract to run out and i was talking to zoom in for leaders recently and of course they they know that right they they have the data on that one sure so, so adoption is very very uh, very very important um no one really asks me when they say they'll say amarpreet tell me how this works amarpreet what's your roi uh, show us everyone asks those questions barely anyone comes and says amarpreet show me your adoption metrics how many people you know show me three companies where you've deployed and show me how many people use it every day versus every week versus every month versus they never use it extremely extremely uh, you know important at this point of uh, uh, time we've spent quite a bit of time i'm on a limb here but i i 
doubt if there's any tool, Jeff, that has better flow of work integration than us. Uh, if, if I was, uh, and maybe I'll send it to you in an email, right, in a screenshot. So we're all, any major platform, major, we, not everyone, but all major platforms, Salesloft, Outreach, HubSpot, Salesforce, uh, Zoho, Gmail, Outlook, you go there, we just show up as if we are a native feature. When you're personalizing email, there's a yellow button that pops up. You just have to click it. When you're making a call, there's a bunch of call-related insights that pop up. You just have to read them right at that point and keep those in mind. When you go to LinkedIn, same thing happens. When you go to Salesforce, same thing happens. So that integration into the flow of work, uh, we spent, my engineering team, I think they got stuck with one technical challenge. And they said, hey, I think it was HubSpot. And they said, we, we user will have to copy paste that email into HubSpot. You know, that's the only experience we can create. And I think we spent a month and a half uh, because I was not okay. I said, no, that's, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. You know, if you ask people to copy paste, they would not. It has to happen right. inside the HubSpot box. They have to be within HubSpot. They just click a button and that email has to just change. Ask the user saying if this is okay. And that's, that's as if HubSpot has given them this disk personalization, disk fine tuning capability. So, so that's where we've spent a ton of time. Probably the most important thing, more important than even the results, because if there's no adoption, there will be no results. And the big question that uh, most, most buyers don't ask, they should ask, especially about AI and especially about tools today. It's the most important question, even more important than what is the ROI. Yeah, if they're not using it, there is no ROI. There is no so ROI. You, you can make up whatever numbers you know they wanted to, but uh, yeah, the the value is all in the use. So that's really smart that you focus so much time there, and just made it where it's it's just part of the workflow, very natural. Yes. Well, where can people learn more about you and about Humantic online? Well, till today, I used to say, just look for Amarpreet Kalkat. I'm the only Amarpreet Kalkat. Uh, then uh, yesterday, I was doing a bit of ego surfing. And I found there's some Amarpreet Kalgad in New, New Zealand. Um, <laughs> so, so, but yes, uh, luckily it's still two Amarpreet Kalgads. If you look for Amarpreet Kalgad, you will uh, find me. Um, we are called Humantic AI. Uh, Humantic is human TIC, you know, which is take on uh, like a human way of things doing so, you know, uh, that's, that's what Humantic AI is. Um, there's a human natic AI. Please don't get confused with that, right? Humantic and human ethic are, uh, different. Uh, so Humantic AI, Amarpreet Kalkar should be easy enough uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, uh, or just simply go to our website, humantic.ai, uh, uh, or you could go to buyerintelligence.org. You know, that's uh, that's a new site we put together uh, to help people learn more about buyer intelligence and what it can do uh, for them. Right. We'll make sure and link that in, in the right Humantic. Right. We'll make sure to link that in the show notes. So if anybody, you know, has any question, it's really easy to find it there. And then to your LinkedIn as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that'll be wonderful, Jeff. This is a great conversation. Thanks for being on SaaS Fuel. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me here. Like I said, I you know, love the opportunity. And especially when someone asks the right questions that you feel passionately about it, it becomes uh, uh, energizing and even joyful. Outstanding. Thanks again, Amar Freight, for coming on the show and sharing your journey and insights. You can learn more about Amarpreet and Humantic at humantic.ai. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel as well. We've got full episodes, video shorts, training, and quite a bit more there. Thought leaders share. This week, share with somebody who wants to make more sales and increase revenue, whether they use AI today or they don't. Everyone who shares this week gets a throttle through the funnel toolkit. It's a set of tools that helps you speed through the buyer journey with precision of a super bike from awareness to purchase in record time. Join us Thursday on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series where my guest is JP Albano, co-founder and CEO of Significant Lifestyle Communities. They're managing over 60 million in assets. We'll be talking about ways to create and preserve wealth from a profitable SaaS and after exit. And next Tuesday, we have founder Glenn Paul, president of Dot Photo, specializing in enhancing customer experiences through technology and personalized products as well. 
I will see you next time. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SAS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes. Let's go!